Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog. Also, GamblersAdvisory.com. Today is October 25th, 2021. Now, the White House, the Biden White House, has issued a statement that they are pushing back the release of further JFK assassination files. Right, Joe Biden himself has issued a statement that the release of the files right now would cause identifiable harm. Understand, those are the only grounds upon which Joe Biden could refuse to release the files, right? You have the JFK Act. The files should be released, unless, of course, there's a determination that there is identifiable harm. Folks, let's talk about the centerpiece, in my opinion, of the Kennedy assassination, right? I believe that we've been looking in the wrong place. It's clear if you track crimes that evidence of a conspiracy of something improper is right in front of us. It doesn't come from the Zapruder film, right? It doesn't come from the Tippett shooting. Rather, it comes from something that takes place before the assassination. Let's go over it. On November 25th, 1963, unemployed Lee Harvey Oswald, folks, he's not even working at the Texas School Book Depository Building. Unemployed Lee Harvey Oswald gets his unemployment check. It's a whopping $33. Now, Oswald is 23 at the time. He and his wife are pregnant. Marina would give birth the very next month. Now, just understand... On September 26, 1963, the day after he gets his unemployment check, 23-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald boards a bus for Laredo, Texas. He crosses the border into Mexico. Right now, here's what we know. He arrives in Mexico on September 27th, 1963. We know the hotel he's staying in. We know that at 11.30 a.m. on September 27th, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald visits the Cuban embassy. Now, he wanted a visa to go to Cuba. He even has passport photographs. He's told that he can't get the Cuban visa without a Russian visa. From that point forward, Lee Harvey Oswald goes to the Russian embassy, doesn't have any luck. He goes back to the Cuban embassy, doesn't have any luck. On September 30th, 1963, he phones the Russian embassy They don't help him. He then buys a bus ticket and travels back from Mexico City to Laredo, Texas. Now, what I want people to understand is that either someone was following Lee Harvey Oswald on that trip, right, following an unemployed 23-year-old who just got his unemployment check and who was traveling by bus to Mexico. Either someone followed Lee Harvey Oswald or Oswald followed someone. The morning after the President of the United States was assassinated, less than 24 hours after, at 10.01 a.m., FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover 
informed Lyndon Johnson that someone had impersonated Lee Harvey Oswald on this trip to Mexico City. The FBI had both photographs and phone call recordings. This imposter called the Soviet embassy in Mexico City. The imposter even refers to a known assassin, Valery Kustinov, who was very well known to the FBI and the CIA. Right, Kustinov was a KGB agent operating out of the embassy. Now, for more information on this, go to the website history-matters.com slash frameup.htm. Again, history-matters.com slash frameup.htm. Right now, understand who Lyndon Johnson was. Johnson, of course, was the former Senate Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate. Right, so Johnson understood, listening to J. Edgar Hoover, the importance of their conversation. This imposter, just the existence of this imposter, calling the Soviet embassy and being photographed Right, photographed. Not only that, but referring to a KGB agent who worked out of the Soviet embassy completely dispels any thought that Lee Harvey Oswald was not connected or was not being followed by nefarious types. Understand, too, what's so important about Lee Harvey Oswald? 23, with a pregnant wife. He's in Dallas, back in Dallas, after spending some time in New Orleans. Why would anyone consider him to be worth following? Also, how do you follow a guy? when he's taking public transportation. Let's go one step further. Oswald goes to the Cuban embassy first, then is surprised to hear that he needs a Russian visa. But yet this imposter is making calls to the Russian embassy. How could the imposter have known what was said to Lee Harvey Oswald in the Cuban embassy? Also, if the imposter did not have knowledge of what was said in the Cuban embassy, how could the imposter have then followed Lee Harvey Oswald to the Russian embassy without there being some overlap? without there being the risk of someone at the Russian embassy understanding that the real Lee Harvey Oswald was a different person than this fake Oswald. Understand, Lee Harvey Oswald had just visited Mexico. We know the dates, right? He takes the bus on September 26, 1963. Right, he leaves town on October 2nd, 1963. How could an imposter have gotten it together to impersonate Lee Harvey Oswald on that trip unless he was watching Oswald before the trip took place? or unless Oswald was part of some group, of which 
this imposter was a member. Also, let's get the timing. How does J. Edgar Hoover have all of this information within 24 hours of the president's assassination? So if you want to know the real truth to the assassination, I believe all you have to do is look at the Oswald impersonator in Mexico City. Understand, folks, the audio files are missing. The audio files that J. Edgar Hoover refers to in his 10.01 a.m. conversation with new president Lyndon Baines Johnson. How is that possible? Right? Well, now we're finding out that those voice messages may exist because the official FBI story reeks. It has holes. They denied the existence of the voice messages. And then, of course, memos, internal memos showed that FBI agents actually listened to the voice messages. Also, think about it. Again, this is before Oswald gets a job with the Texas School Book Depository. We're supposed to believe that Ruth Payne's neighbor had a job with the Texas School Book Depository, right? The same guy who claims that Oswald told him that he was carrying curtain rods the morning of the assassination. And we're supposed to believe that Oswald, by chance, gets a job with the Texas School Book Depository, which by chance is on the motorcade route that is revised. Right, folks, clearly something's going on here when the imposter in the phone calls is referring to a known KGB agent who's working out of the Soviet embassy. Who would have that information? Not the average neighbor. Not some scamster who's just out trying to make a buck and he sees Lee Harvey Oswald and somehow in 1963, without facial recognition, figures out who he is and where he's going. No, folks, the imposter is an insider. The burden is on us. The burden's on us to figure out what that imposter was on the inside of. Let me also point out, too, in terms of major crimes in American history, isn't the assassination of the President of the United States a major crime? How could the FBI, our FBI, have pictures of this imposter? I know they have at least one. I've seen the picture. How could the FBI have a picture of the imposter and not be able to identify that person publicly to the American people. Who is the person? Right? Understand, the same way the FBI bugged the Soviet embassy to the point where they were able to track the two phone calls this imposter made to the Soviet embassy, just like the FBI knew that a KGB agent was operating out of the Soviet embassy. Right? Someone who was dangerous. Someone referred to by the imposter. How could the FBI not know who this imposter was? Wasn't the assassination of the President of the United States 
a high enough priority crime for the FBI to spend almost every waking moment having teams of agents trying to figure out who this imposter was and how the imposter could possibly figure out that unemployed Lee Harvey Oswald would decide to go to the Cuban embassy and then would be told at the Cuban embassy that he had to get a Soviet visa to travel to Cuba. So this is the centerpiece of the assassination, right? We've been diverted by the Zapruder film, which in my opinion doesn't even show the first shock Right? We've been sidetracked by the Zapruder film, by the logistics of the crime itself. How Lee Harvey Oswald, with no driver's license, could leave the scene of the murder. And how Lee Harvey Oswald, with several witnesses, having a timeline that doesn't conform with the Warren Commission, could then kill Officer Tippett. Right? There are many problems with the facts laid out. We've been focusing on who is Lee Harvey Oswald. Why don't we focus instead on the people around Lee Harvey Oswald? This impersonator. Who is he? Why did he target Lee Harvey Oswald? What's he doing? How did he know about the KGB agent who was on FBI radar at the Soviet embassy. How could he choose to impersonate Lee Harvey Oswald on an exact date when Lee Harvey Oswald, the actual Lee Harvey Oswald, was in Mexico City? Right, folks? That imposter blows the lid off of everything. If our government releases the right documents to us, if we actually get to hear the imposter's voice, and understand this imposter didn't even look like Lee Harvey Oswald, right? If we can figure out who this imposter is, the one that the FBI knew about within, 24 hours of the president's assassination. The one the FBI determined was an imposter. Then I believe the American people will be able to crack the case. Right? We know that Lee Harvey Oswald was in touch with James Hosty, an FBI agent. We know that Lee Harvey Oswald gave James Hosty a note that Hosty disposed of. What I want to know is what happened when Lee Harvey Oswald went to Mexico City, right? We know he actually went to the Cuban embassy. We know he actually went to the Soviet embassy. How was an imposter able to make phone calls to the Soviet embassy while Lee Harvey Oswald was in town. Let's be clear, too. Oswald, who's collecting unemployment checks, did not have the money to hire someone to make calls for him. And why would he want to if he himself is appearing at the embassy. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Please research the imposter. Look at the photo that they have of the imposter and just ask yourself, how could this guy never be identified? Is this guy a member of the intelligence community? Is this guy a member of the mafia? Is this guy a member of 
some foreign intelligence group. Why is the guy talking about a KGB agent who's suspected of being a known assassin? Why is the guy pretending to be Lee Harvey Oswald? And all of this, of course, takes place before Oswald ever gets the job at the Texas School Book Depository. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.